Mm-hmm. We did. You you focused on that and, and emphasized it, and st- therefore we noticed it. <laughs> but otherwise, we might not. Have. Yeah, you could be arguing with Okay, because I would like to go through a couple of key parts. Oh, maybe we won't be able to. Maybe, maybe if we read. Yeah. Glad I thought of it. I'd very much like to get to 50. It's a popular subject. Uh, yep. Yeah. Before he gets into uh, noose and oh, and uh, uh, doxa, true doxa, doxa alatheis, which is. Uh, 51D. Is that too much to do in one evening? Wow. <laughs> it's really one of the greatest pieces, uh, I think. 40E? Is that what she's doing? 40E to 51D. Uh, 44? <laughs> 44, yeah. So that would be six pages of uh, Stephanus numbers. Six pages? Oh, my God. I'll read well, six pages without stopping. <laughs> that wouldn't have been a minute. Anyway. Well, it's uh, forty. Hmm. It so much depends upon getting into to fifty. Mm-hmm. You must do it. So then let's do it. Right, the operation of reason, going in the baffling and obscure form. Would it be? Okay. You just want to jump there? Well, see, it fits together because uh, How are you? Good, how are you? If there's any better, I'd be a twin. Oh. Yeah, so we're really at uh, 44D, is that right? I do believe that's where we left it. 44D? Yeah. On page 99. How is it? I like it. This is the yeah. This is a good part. You didn't bring anything with you, did you, Arthur? Sardines. Can you smell them? <laughs> okay. The more of those Russian things with nice black rye bread for those who are into the European mode tonight. That is a Yeah, but we start early if there's not any dreams. We're going to do a dream? Nobody has a dream. Oh, man, I wanted to do one. Can we close this door? You didn't bring yours, though. No, I want to do somebody else's. Mm. (laughs) I have a dream. (laughs) Give him a brand new life. I give you mine, you can do mine. Yeah. (laughs) But just to, uh, since no one is around and we have nothing else to do, if you want, I think there's a really important section we went over last time, but I think maybe take make sure we look at it. Just at 44, the problem of intensity or peak experiences. Mm. This and such like are just what the revolutions of the soul experience with intensity. And every time they happen upon any external object, whether it has to be of the class of the same or the other, it may proclaim it to be the same as something or other than something contrary to the truth and thereby proves themselves false and foolish and devoid at such times 
of any <coughs> pardon me, revolution that rules and guides. So that whole thing is the problem of intensity, right? And that the consequences on the soul. Yeah. So notice his solution. <clears throat> but as soon as the stream of increase and in nutriment enters in less volume, and the revolutions calm down and pursue their own path, becoming more stable as time pr proceeds, then at length. As the several circles move, each according to its natural track, their revolutions are straightened out, and they announce the same and the other aright, mm. and thereby they render their processor pronation. Mm. I like it. Right? Mm -hmm. What's the problem? Can you picture? Oh. Yeah, that's pretty easily pictured. Yeah, he's saying for a certain class of experiences that have their origin and sensation, <coughs> their peaks. Right. And he's saying, hey, you know what? Right. The generation of bodies in several parts. And blah, 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 blah. Got it? Got it all? No. The as the intensity increases, he said, oh, the rational part proceeds. He said, therefore, reduce the volume and stay on the plateau. Right. Mm -hmm. And see, then it's a revolution that calmed down and pursued their own path. There is no need for any discipline or, or practice. <coughs> then it follows its own logos, follows its own path. <coughs> it has its own direction. <coughs> Becoming more stable, as time proceeds, right? Don't take its time, right? Mm -hmm. As time proceeds. <clears throat> then at length, then the several circles move each according to their own track. Right? Because he's always talking about it. The revolution of the same and the other. Right? Mm -hmm. That starts the center. That has its own direction. And there, thereby, they render the possessor Safruna. Or he calls it intelligent. Mm -hmm. right. See, the rush to this. I said, no, 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 no. As soon as the stream of increase in nutrient enters in less volume, so this is a line of less volume. Can't that? also mean the intensity of our experience as we get older the intensity of experience is more is, is lessened don't go for the peak yeah because it peaks so. yeah. 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 see it's the same problem in Plato's Republic remember the problem uh, that's my bookie tell him put it on the fifth horse no no the sixth is a better <laughs> In the Republic, the battle between uh, 
desire, remember, pleasure, pain. Desire and fear. Right, 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 right. right. Don't let it go to the peak. Huh? <clears throat> Do we know what the nutriment is at this point? Pardon, pardon anymore? What is the nutriment that's being, that enters in less volume? What is it? But as soon as the stream of increase in nutrient, because this is, this power coming up is a source of nutrient, it's, it's, a, it's a vitality, it's a vitality, it's, a, it's real. Um, but then it just cascades into a peak and he's saying, hey man, go this way. So then that, that then returns to the individual without doing anything. No, no intellectual exercise, no meditation, no nothing. Take care of it. It'll do it by itself. Come on, stop fooling around. Has his own natural track. The re revolution's calmed down. But through their own path, becoming more stable as time proceeds, then at length, uh, as the several circles move each according to their own natural track, the revolutions are straightened out and they announce the same or the other right, rendering the possessor intelligence and phrenesis. And if this be the state of, the, of his soul, be reinforced by right educational training, the man becomes wholly sound and faultless, having escaped the worst of the maladies. Right? And that has yet to come, but he's going to cover that later. Right? And, uh, Pierre? I would just, uh, reminds me of what I was just reading in the Phaedrus, where they're talking about, uh, where they're, um, there's a, a big old uh, battle going on between people that want to get over the That's right. ark. That's right. Get on the other side of the ark, and there's a bunch of people that, in, in, mm -hmm. try, in so doing, trying to get to that peak, yeah. they yeah. wind up getting hurt. Because the black horse is going to the peak. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't kill the black horse or exile him. Mm -hmm. Finally, then. He slips it underneath. He slips it underneath. That's what this is. You're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Mm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm. Interesting work. Mm -hmm. Greek did it, didn't he? I think so. <laughs> yeah. I'm not mistaken. Mm. Um, now, uh, it's worth going to page 233, which is 86B. Now we're back to pleasure and pains in excess. See, he doesn't have a war against pleasure and pain. Right. The excess, he's got excess. See, peak, peak excess. Now this is hard to read in one sense because of uh, the word fire, which he changes several times in a very nice way, but it produces inflammations. But in any case, um, these are the problems of the soul which due to the condition of the body arise in the following way. We must agree that folly is the disease of the soul. And, and a folly, there are two kinds. Madness, ignorance. Whatever affection a man suffers from, if it involves either of these conditions, disease, <clears throat> and we must maintain that pleasures and pains in excess <clears throat> are the greatest of the soul's diseases. Back to same thing. See, peak. For when a man is overjoyed, the contrary, he suffers excessively from pain, 
being in haste to seize on the one and avoid the other beyond measure. Right? He's unable to see. See? It's, a, it's insatiable or it can't be dealt with or addictive if you prefer. And therefore he's incapable of exercising reason. And this is now where he goes back into that idea of uh, and seed, etc. Um, and if we can just get someone to read this, um, and whenever a man, <coughs> I need something to drink for a moment. So. Need a reader? Well, would you please? Thank you. <coughs> Where are you? Two thirty-five <coughs> and three top of the page, three top. lines down. On page two thirty-five. Yeah. And whenever a man's seed grows to abundant volume in his marrow, as it were a tree that is overladen beyond measure with fruit. He brings on himself, time after time, many pangs and many pleasures, owing to his desires, and the issue thereof, and the issue thereof, and comes to be in a state of madness for the most part of his life, because of those greatest of pleasures and pains, and keeps his soul diseased and senseless by reason of the action of his body. Yet such a man is reputed to be voluntarily wicked and not diseased. Although in truth, the sexual incontinence, which is due for the most part to the abundance and fluidity of one substance because of the porosity of the bones, constitutes a disease of the soul. Oh, and thank indeed, you, thank you. No, get, get, please go on. And indeed, almost all those affections which are called by way of reproach incontinence and pleasure, as though the wicked act voluntarily, are wrongly so reproached. See, it's not acting voluntarily, it becomes automatic. Go ahead. For no one is voluntarily wicked, but the wicked man becomes wicked by reason of some evil condition of body and unskilled nurture. And these are experiences which are hateful to everyone and involuntary. And again, in respect of pains likewise, the soul acquires much evil because of the body. You want me to keep going? Well, um, detail. Um, yeah. So you want to get now to the to the remedial treatment which is in the next paragraph. You can just go to the next one. You want me to jump or you want me yeah. to Yeah, again. Again, it is reasonable and proper to set forth in turn the subject complementary to the foregoing, namely the remedial treatment of body and mind and the causes which can serve this. For what is good merits description more than what is evil. All that is good and beautiful, and the beautiful is not void of due measure. All that is good is beautiful, and the beautiful is not void of due measure. Wherefore, also, the living creature that is to be beautiful must be symmetrical. Of symmetries we distinguish and reason about such as are small, but of the most important and the greatest we have no rational comprehension. For with respect to health and disease, virtue and vice, there is no symmetry or want of symmetry greater than that which exists between the soul itself and the body itself. But as regards these, we wholly fail to perceive or reflect that whenever a weaker and inferior type of body is the vehicle of a soul that is strong and in all ways great, or conversely, when each of these two is of the opposite kind, then the creature as a whole is not beautiful seeing that it is unsymmetrical in respect of the greatest of symmetry. Yeah, it's all connected with that one word, symmetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to, to 
again, it's avoid the peak, find the mean <coughs> between the two. Neither exercise, cut in the next page, neither exercise the soul without the body nor the body without the soul, so that they may be evenly matched and sound of health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just thought we'd just take a few minutes on that. Uh, See, this really describes in a lot of ways their astrological thinking of the time, because the fire, earth, air, and water was the phlegmatic, sanguine, caloric, uh, uh, and melancholic structure of a man. Mm -hmm. If you had an overabundance of fire and it mingled with either of the other ones, you became ill. And this is where they watch the planetary approaches in their charts to find where these illnesses lie. Yeah, this is, this is all there. This is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the work could get popular if it wasn't so old. <laughs> I think it's too old. I yeah, agree. I do too. Yeah. Well, at certain times, it would be better for him to be blunt, but he isn't. You noticed? <laughs> so we'll pick up then back to 44D in a few minutes, okay, and do our work for the evening. And I thought just for a few minutes we have a little fun with this happening. By the way, that system still works very well. Oh, good. Okay. Where, where are we? We are at, you want to do it then? Sure. Where are Page we? Page 99. 99. Thank you. <laughs> 99. The Divine Revolutions. Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, to start this, we should start it over here to have more fun. <clears throat> Go ahead. The divine revolutions, which are two, they bound within a sphere-shaped body in imitation of the spherical form of the all, which, which body we now call the head. Hmm, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. it, be, it being the most divine part and reigning over all the parts within us. To it the gods delivered over the whole of the body. They, to it the gods delivered over the whole of the body. They had assembled. I didn't understand that. To it the gods delivered the whole of the body. To it, the gods delivered the whole of the body. Oh, thank you. To it. Okay, so it's that. To it, the gods delivered the whole of the body. They had body. They had assembled to be its servant. Okay, thanks. Having formed the notion that it should partake in all the motions which were to be, in order then that it should not go rolling upon the earth, which has all manner of heights and hollows, and be it at loss how to climb over the one and climb out of the other. They bestowed upon it the whole body as a vehicle and means of transport. <clears throat> and for this reason, the body acquired length and, by God's contriving, shot forth four limbs, extensible and flexible, to serve as instruments of transport, so that grasping with these and supported thereon it was enabled to travel through all places, bearing aloft the chamber of our most divine and holy part. In this wise, and for these reasons, were legs and hands attached to all men. And inasmuch as they demand the forepart superior to the hinder part in honor and dignity, the gods gave us the most part of, part of our going the gods gave us the most part of our going in this direction. Thus it was necessary that man should have the forepart of his body distinct and dissimilar. Wherefore, dealing first with the vessel of the head, they set the face in the front 
thereof, and bound it within it organs for all, the forethought of the soul. And they adorned that this, which is the natural front, should be the leading part. And of the organs, they constructed first light-bearing eyes, and these they fixed in the face for the reason following. They contrived that all such fire as had the property not of burning, but of giving a mild light, should form a body akin to the light of every day. For they caused the pure light within us, which is akin to that of day, to flow through the eyes in a smooth and dense stream. And they compressed the whole substance, and especially the center of the eyes, so that they occluded all other fire that was coarser and allowed only and allowed only this pure kind of fire to filter through. So whenever the stream of vision is surrounded by midday light, it flows out like unto light, and coalescing therewith, it forms one kindred substance along the path of the eye's vision, wheresoever the fire which streams from within collides with an obstructing object without. And this substance, having all become similar in its properties, because of its similar nature, distributes the motions of every object it touches, or whereby it is touched, throughout all the body, even unto the soul, and brings about that sensation which we now term seeing. But when the kindred fire vanishes into night, the inner fire is cut off. For when it issues forth into what is dissimilar, it becomes altered in itself and is quenched, seeing that it is no longer of like nature with the adjoining air, since that air is of devoid of fire. Wherefore it leaves all seeing, wherefore it leaves off seeing, and becomes also an inducement to sleep for the eyelids whose structure the gods devised as a safeguard for the vision when they are shut closed curb the power of the inner fire which power dissipates and allays the inner motions and upon this allaying quiet ensues allaying quiet ensues and when this quiet has become intense there falls upon us a sleep that is well nigh dreamless. But when some greater motions are still left behind, according to their nature and the positions they occupy, such and so great are the images they produce, which images are copied within and are remembered by the sleepers when they awake out of the dream. And it is no longer difficult to perceive the truth about the formation of images in mirrors and in bright and smooth surfaces of every kind. It is from the combination with each other of the inner and the outer fires, every time that they unite on the smooth surface and are variously deflected. And all such reflections necessarily result owing to the fire of the reflected face, coalescing with the fire of the vision on the smooth and bright surface. And left appears as right, because contact takes place between opposite portions of the visual stream and opposite portions of the object, contrary to the regular mode of collision. Contrarywise, right appears as right, and left as left whenever the fire changes sides on coalescing with the object wherewith it coalesces. And this occurs whenever the smooth surface of the mirrors, being elevated on this side and on that, repels the right portion of the visual stream to the left and the left to the right. And when this same mirror is turned lengthwise to the face, it makes the whole face appear upside down, 
since it repels the bottom of the ray to the top, and conversely, the top to the bottom. Okay. Well, that's we interesting. Need a careful translation as we proceed, as you will notice as we go from this point on. Uh, <coughs> uh, there are several key passages here, but uh, it goes on from this point for uh, two and a half pages. So, uh, are you for another? Sure. Louder? Okay. <clears throat> now, all these are among the auxiliary causes which God employs as his ministers in perfecting, so far as possible, the form of the most good. Stop. Can't be. <coughs> oh, the form? <coughs> How do you want to render that? The idea of the good. Idea of the good. Okay. All of these auxiliary causes have only one purpose. Right? In perfecting as far as possible the form of the idea of the good. Hmm. Now, he's got to make that clear. It is the, it is Aristo right here. So that's why he's translating it most good, which is interesting, will be interesting to see. Therefore, you would strengthen. Well, no, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure how I would go with that, because, um, Any ideas? I would say uh, the the idea of the better. Not, Not the, best. the best. The best. Yeah. No, the best. Hmm. Yeah, the best. Hmm. Now. Watch what, what he does with us now. He shifts gears. Go ahead. <clears throat> but by the most of men, they are supposed to be not auxiliary, but primary but causes. Primary causes. Of all things. Hey, they're mistaken. <coughs> okay, go ahead. Cooling and heating, solidifying and dissolving, and producing all such of effects. Yet they are incapable of possessing reason and thought for any purpose. For as we must affirm the one and only existing thing which has the property of acquiring thought is soul, and soul is invisible, whereas fire and water and earth and air are all visible bodies. And the lover of thought and knowledge must needs pursue first the causes which belong to the intelligent nature. And right. put problem. Go ahead. And put second all such as are of the class of things which are moved by others and themselves in turn move others because they cannot help it. And okay. we almost oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, just the Go ahead. Uh, we are the lovers of thought, so we want to get that clearer, don't we? Mm -hmm. And the lover of thought and knowledge. Right? Mm -hmm. And there are very curious words in here. Noose Let's and yes, please. Noose and episteme, right? The erastane. Which is To de nu. Yes. Noose and episteme. Mm -hmm. Erastane, right? And then, then that's the emphronos, mm -hmm. museos. Yeah. Therefore. We're back to phrenesis. Mm -hmm. mm. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. hmm. Oh, what is it? <clears throat> and we. Okay. What must oh, we put aside? Let's just keep key to the whole okay. where he's going. Go ahead. And second, and put second 
and put second all such as are of the class of things which are moved by others and themselves, in turn, move the others because they cannot help it. Hey, wait a minute. What does that, what does that include? Hmm. Bodies. The whole natural world. The whole natural world. The whole natural world. So go back and look at it again. Okay. And put second all such as are of the class of things which are moved by others and themselves in turn move others because they cannot help it. Well, then how are we going to pursue the things which belong to the class of Phonesis? Uh, well, that, this is where we're going. Okay, go ahead. I have to pursue the question. And, uh, Ian, Please. isn't this also uh, talking about what uh, Socrates said in the Phaedo, where he was talking about that when he had come across a book by Anaxagoras, and at first he thought he would have found a, a really interesting, a very good boon, uh, a heaven sent, because uh, he talked about mind. But then as he started looking into it, he found out that he wasn't talking mm. about things of the mind at all. Mind is cause, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Like it. Okay. Now shift. Here comes the shift. This is what we have to follow. Go ahead. Okay. And we also must lo act likewise. We must declare both kinds of causes, but keep distant those which distinct. Distinct. Oh, distinct. <clears throat> but keep distinct those of which want to do it again we must declare we must declare both kinds of causes but keep distinct those which with the aid of thought are artificers of things beautiful and good and, and all thought, the of course is news news and all <laughs> those which are devoid of news phronesis Oh, and produce always accidental and irregular effects. <coughs> okay, got that? What's, right, I've got to hold that fast. We must declare no, no, no. both okay. kinds of... You've got to make sure you hold on to that. I was just rereading it. Okay, that's good. We must declare that. Right. We must declare both kinds of causes, but keep distinct those which, with the aid of news, are artificers of things beautiful and good. And all those which are devoid of phronesis and produce always accidental and irregular effects. <laughs> Therefore, that also includes phronesis, since they are devoid of it. Okay, let's see where and it, it goes. It seems like, it, wouldn't it also include, Pardon? well, it, sound, it looks like it's going down the road of providence, because those which then had phronesis would produce effects which were non-accidental non and regular, okay. if you can read it that way. That's right. where we're going. Okay. That's where we're going. Thomas Taylor mm -hmm. calls that wisdom, though. This is where I get confused. Phronesis. Mm -hmm. Wisdom, what's the percentage? Oh, that's temperance. Yeah. Okay, what's... Sophia. Okay. Now we Sophia. must declare the benefit Thomas that comes in this way. Go ahead. Next. But it's a real problem. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, re now, regarding the auxiliary causes, which have helped the eyes to acquire the power which they now possess. Let this statement suffice. Next, we must declare the most important benefit affected by them, for the sake of which God bestowed them upon us. Vision. Okay, now we're going back to this model. Okay. Vision, in my view, is the cause of the greatest benefit to us inasmuch as none of the accounts now given concerning the universe would ever have been given if men had not been the stars or the sun or the heaven. But as it is, the vision of day and night and of months and circling years has created the art of number and has given us not only the notion of time but also means of research into the nature of the universe. From these, we have procured philosophy in all its range, than which no greater boon ever has come or will come by divine bestowal unto the race of mortals. This I affirm to be the greatest good of eyesight. 
Yeah, what are they? Vision of day, night, months, years, <clears throat> number. Number. Seeing the sun and the stars gives, right? Right. Mm -hmm. By looking at the sun and the stars, number mm -hmm. gives us an insight into the nature of the cosmos mm -hmm. and through wonder philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, take a look at it. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, continue. From these we have procured philosophy in all its range, than which no greater boon ever has come or will come by divine bestowal unto the race of mortals. This I affirm to be the greatest good of eyesight. As for all the lesser goods, why should we celebrate them? He that is no philosopher, when deprived of the sight thereof, may utter vain lamentation may utter vain lamentations. But the cause and purpose of that best good, as we must maintain, you want me to stop? No, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. But the cause and purpose of that best good, as we must maintain, is this, that God devised and bestowed upon us vision to the end, that we might behold the revolutions of reason in the heaven and use them for the revolvings of reasoning that is within us. These being akin to those, the perturbable to the imperturbable. Imper Sounds like Thomas Taylor. And that through learning and sharing in calculations, which are correct by their nature, by imitation of the absolute the unvarying revel that didn't sound right let me finish let me do it again but the cause and the purpose of the that best good as we must maintain is this that god devised and bestowed upon us vision to the end that we might behold the revolutions of reason in the heaven and use them for the revolvings of the reasoning that is within us these being akin to those the perturbable to the imperturbable and that through learnings and sharing and calculations, which are correct by their nature, by imitation of the absolutely in unvarying revolutions of the God, we might stabilize the variable revolutions within ourselves. That's the first major insight of how to play the game, and now we get the best one yet to come. Okay? Concerning sound also and hearing, once more we make the same declaration that they were bestowed by the gods with the same object and for the same reasons. For it was for these same purposes that speech was ordered, and it makes the greatest contribution thereto. Music too, insofar as it uses audible sound, was bestowed for the sake of harmony. And harmony, which has motions akin to the revolutions of the soul within us, was given by the muses to him who makes intelligent use of the muses. Not as an aid to irrational pleasure, as is now supposed, but as an auxiliary to the inner revolution of the soul, <clears throat> when it has lost its harmony, to assist in restoring it to order and concord with itself. Purpose of music, right? See the way he puts it? Mm -hmm. Harmony, concord, go ahead. And because of the unmodulated condition, deficient in grace, which exists in most of us, rhythm also was bestowed upon us to be helper by the same deities and for the same ends. Hmm. The foregoing part of our discourse save for a small portion, has been an exposition of the operations of reasons. But we must also furnish an account of what comes into existence through necessity. So this now is a, another look at creation. Mm -hmm. For in truth, this cosmos, in its origin, 
was generated as a compound from the combination of necessity and reason. And inasmuch as reason was controlling necessity by persuading her to conduct to the best end the most part of the things coming into existence, thus and thereby it came about, through necessity yielding to intelligent persuasion that this universe of ours was being in this wise constructed at the beginning. Do you want to make any changes in that? <coughs> Watch for an excess. Wherefore, oh sure. Infernos. In, yeah, the persuasion is infernos persuasion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do it again, Barbara. No, I was just saying, they say intelligent persuasion, but it's yeah. actually it's infernos. Phronosis and, and persuasion. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Hmm. Wherefore, if one is to declare how it actually came into being on this wise, he must include also the form of the errant cause in the way that it act, really acts. To this point, therefore, we must return, and taking once again a fresh starting point suitable to the matter we must, suitor, suitable to the ma matter, we must make a fresh start in dealing therewith, just as we did with our previous subjects. We must gain a view of the real nature of fire and water, air and earth. Right, because that's in this world, okay? Right. As it was before the birth of heaven, and the properties they had before that time. For at present, no one has as yet declared their generation, but we assume that men know what fire is, and each of these things and we call them principles and presume that they are elements of the universe. Although, in truth, they do not so much as deserve to be likened with any likelihood by the man who has even a grain of sense to the class of syllables. Okay. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Yeah, what, is, what did you just read? I don't know. <laughs> what? Just, like, yeah. How did we... Get into syllables. I think that's a reference to the, uh, the hearing from before. Yeah, big reference. It jumped. Okay. Juan had a contribution. No, no, it, it, Go ahead, I didn't hear it. The way you're reading it. Is it the see way it I'm again. reading it? Come, see it again. Okay. Look at it again. We must gain a view of the real nature of fire, water, earth, and air. For at present, no one has as yet declared their generation. Right. Mm. Go ahead. But, but we assume that men know what fire is. And, and each, each of these things, these things. Right. Mm -hmm. And we call them principles and presume that they are elements. Although, in truth, they do not so much as deserve to be likened with any likelihood by the man, right? The, the man who has even a grain of sense to the class of syllables. Like, what did you say? I don't know. Well, there's a big difference, isn't there, between syllables and, and elements of the universe and principles? Right? But if it's a man of sense? They do not deserve to be likened. By okay. the man who has even a grain of sense to the, to the class of syllables. Now we're going to get the need for a whole re-examination of these things, and this is perhaps a high point in the whole time in us. Right, so let's watch it. Huh. For the present, however, let our procedure be as follows. We shall not now expound the principle of all things or their principles, or whatever term we use concerning them. And that's solely for this reason, that it is difficult for us to explain our views while keeping to our present method of exposition. Yeah, we're not, we're not going to tell you the truth about it. Thank you. 
I'm going to tell you the truth about it. We'll give you a likely story. Thank you. Go ahead. <coughs> you therefore ought not to suppose that I should expound them, while as for me, I should never be able to convince myself that I should be right in attempting to undertake so great a risk. Oh, task. Task, sorry. All right. All right, risk. What's he saying? Come on. Too big. Too big. <laughs> it's too, too big. big to say. Yeah, no, too difficult to explain <clears throat> our views while we're stuck with this present discourse. Hmm. Hmm. So what's he going to offer? Go ahead. Strictly adhering then to what we previously affirmed, the import of the likely account, I will essay, as I did before, to give us likely an exposition as any other, nay, more so, regarding both particular things and the totality of things from the very beginning. Right. And well, now he's repeating the same thing, 29, right? Good old 29. Back to 29. You're familiar with 27 C to 29A. Okay, go ahead. And hmm. as before. Right. He's using the same model as previously. Go ahead. So now, at the commencement of our account, we must call upon God the Savior to bring us safe through a novel and unwanted exposition to a conclusion based on likelihood. And okay. thus begin our good. account once more. Yeah, good news, yeah. okay. Well, okay, look at That's a whole prelude to where we're going. We've got two pages and two and a half pages, and it's really tight and good reason. Let's see him do it. All right, shall we? Another reader, jump in. New yeah. reader. Neither, okay. Uh, but Neither, therefore. No, but how about staying with one? Stay, switch the one. Oh, one. sure. Oh. One, one, three, one, thirteen. Thank you. Okay, we must, however, in beginning our fresh account of the universe, make more distinctions than we did before. For whereas then we distinguish two forms, we must now declare another third kind. For our former exposition, those two were sufficient, one of them being assumed as a model form, intelligible and ever uniformly existent, and the second as the model's copy, subject to becoming <laughs> and visible. A third kind we did not at that time distinguish considering that those two were sufficient. But now the argument seems to compel us to try to reveal by words a form that is baffling and obscure. That's what we're getting at. What kind of a form? Baffling. Baffling, baffling. baffling <coughs> and obscure. And it is really interesting. Let's see. Go ahead. What essential property, then, are we to conceive it to possess this in particular, that it should be the receptacle, and as it were, the nurse of all becoming? Got it? Okay. Hmm. We're talking about this realm, right? Becoming. Watch what he does with it, right? Realm of becoming. <laughs> so it's going to hold it and help it? And make earth. Okay. This in particular, that it should be the receptacle, and as it were, the nurse of all becoming. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yet true though this statement is, we must needs describe it more plainly. That, however, is a difficult task, especially because it is necessary for its sake to discuss first the problem of fire and its fellow elements. For in regard to these, it is hard to say which particular element we ought really to term water rather than fire, and which we ought to term any one element rather than each and all of them, That's while the still whole... applying a terminology that is reliable and stable. Okay, look here. That's the whole, that's the, that's where we're going. It's all in that one sentence. Here it is. For in regard to these, the elements, you know, it is hard to say which particular element we ought really to term water rather than fire. 
and which we ought to term any one element rather than each and all of them, while still employing a terminology that is reliable and stable. Hmm. What does that mean? State of flux. Well, we know, yeah, state of flux. Fire. <coughs> it's really, we could talk about water, but what is it? What is he saying about water? We might just as well call it fire. Call it fire, or. <coughs> Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Does it change That's why it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make any sense, does it? Good. Right? Doesn't make any sense, does it? Good. Of course it makes a great deal of sense. You don't want to call water fire. That's stupid. Good. Now we're reading. Go ahead. How then shall we handle this problem, and what likely solution can we offer? First of all, we see that which that we see that which we now call water becoming by condensation, as we believe, stones and earth, and again the same substance by dissolving and dilating, becoming breath and air, and air through combustion becoming fire, and conversely, fire when contracted and quenched returning back to the form of air, and <coughs> air once more uniting and condensing into cloud and mist, and issuing from these, when still further compressed, flowing water, and from water, earth, and stones again. Thus we see the elements passing on to one another, as it would seem, in an unbroken circle, the gift of birth. Hmm. Accordingly, since no one of these ever remains identical in appearance, which of them shall a man definitely affirm to be any one particular element and no other without incurring ridicule? None such exists. On the contrary, by far the safest plan in treating of these elements is to proceed thus. Whatsoever object we perceive to be constantly yeah, okay. changing. That went out just for a second. Uh -huh. Go back to none such exists. On the contrary, Accordingly, since no one of these ever remains identical in appearance, which of them shall a man definitely affirm to be any one particular element and no other without incurring ridicule? None such exists. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, by far the safest plan in treating of these elements is to proceed in this way. I'm going to tell you what to do. Right? Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, now look here. See these? If you watch the way he describes those and what happens to them, uh, this is a four-term uh, system. And if you put them in terms of the way in which he describes them, you can set them up in analogies. The way in which they combine is irrational, by the way. But, but we, we do that after. Okay. Here we go. On Watch now. On the contrary, by far, the safest plan in treating of these elements is to proceed thus. Whatsoever object we perceive to be constantly changing from one state to another, like fire, that object be it fire, must never describe as this, but as such like. Ah, okay, what is fire, what should we call it? Such like. Such like. Such like. Because? Because it only appears to be fire for a second. No, well, because it could just as equally appear as any of the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Watch what happens now. Nor should we ever call water this. What should we call it? Such, such like. like. Good heavens, go ahead. Nor should we describe any other element as though it possessed stability of all those which we indicate by using the terms this and that, and suppose ourselves to refer to a definite object. For such an object shuns and eludes the names this and that, and every name which indicates that they are stable. Thus we must not call the several elements these. We must not even call them by their plural collective name even so indiscriminate as to call them these, right? You can't even lump them together. But in right. regard to each of them and all together, we must apply the term 
Such like. So if you put them all together, what are you going to call them? Yeah, such like. Each individual? Such like. Collectively? Such, such like. like. Go ahead. By the name of fire. <laughs> and so with everything else that is generated. But that wherein they are always in appearance coming severally into existence, and where from in turn they perish, in describing that and that alone, should we employ the terms this and that? I want to know how he's now going to use these two words, this and that. Yeah. That's all. Mm. Mm. Would you not agree, all of these such like, they do come into appearance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And if they're coming severally into existence, and wherefrom, in turn, they perish, in describing that and that alone, should we employ such terms, this and that? So it's only in that split second between, when they're when they're transforming from one to another, that they that they're this and that. I don't know. Right. So hold on to that. We'll take just a couple more sentences and okay. go back to it. Go ahead. Whereas in describing what is such like, hot for instance, or white, or any of the opposite qualities, or any compounds thereof, we ought never to apply to it any of these terms. Okay, look, see. <laughs> but you agree now we can say these terms are the terms of appearance. Wrong name. They're all nothing other than such likes. But they do appear, and they have some source, and they exit. So look her. So this is any one of them. Well, what is it? Such like. Like, what, what did I, it's why I'm not too, such like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's where we're going. Right? Because this is the color, as it were, right? The eyes see it. That's not the thing. That's not what it is. What is it that all of these qualities hang on to? I mm. like better agree. No one has ever seen a thing in their life. Agree? If, if he's right. Well, no, no, he's obviously right. Yeah. What's the only thing you ever see? Such likes. Color. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's all you ever see is what? You never saw a thing in your life then. What is the only thing you've ever seen? Oh, color. Oh. <laughs> Colorful such like. Well, what the hell is the thing? I don't know, it's color. I didn't ask you whether it's color. I want to know about the thing. Oh. He tried to trick him. It's color. Red, green, pink. You're telling me the color, not the thing. Could you paint it? Uh-huh. Would that change it? Uh, uh, I don't know. Well, let's peel it off. Okay, we're going to peel it off. That's what we're going to do. What are we going to do? Peel off. Let's see what it is. Okay? All right. Care for another page? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. But we must bestir ourselves to explain this matter again yet more clearly. Yeah, we need it. Go ahead. Now imagine that a man were to model all possible figures out of gold, and were then to proceed without cessation to remodel each of these into every other. Then, if someone were to point to one of the figures and ask what it is, by far the safest reply and point of truth would be that it is gold. But as for the triangle and all the other figures which were formed in it, one should never describe them as being 
seeing that they change even while one is mentioning them. Rather, one should be content if the figure admits of even the, the title such like being applied to it with any safety. And of the substance which receives all bodies, the same account must be given. It must be called always by the same name, for from its own proper quality it never departs at all. For while it is always receiving all things, nowhere and in no wise does it assume any shape similar to any of the things that enter into it. For it is laid down by nature as a molding stuff for everything, being moved and marked by the entering figures, and because of them it appears different at different times. And the figures that enter and depart are copies of those that are always existent, being stamped from them in a fashion marvelous and hard to describe, which we shall investigate hereafter. Good. What did you just say? And of the substance which receives all these bodies, the same account must be given. Must be called always by the same name. For from its own proper quality, it never departs at all. Hey, it's unchanging. And while it's always receiving all things, nowhere, and in no wise, does it assume any shape similar to any of the things that enter into it? It's a molding stuff for everything. Being moved and marked by entering figures, and because of them it appears different at different times. And the figures that enter and depart are copies of those that always existed, that are always existence, being stamped from them in a fashion marvelous and hard to describe, which, which we'll investigate hereafter. Now, watch what he does with the mother and father and child. Okay? You got a question? Hold on. <clears throat> when, when Aristotle talks about prime matter, oh. is this... This is Gula. This is a Gula. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, he doesn't call it this. Yeah, go ahead. We charge. For the present, then, we must conceive of three kinds. The becoming, that wherein it becomes, and the source, wherefrom the beginning, the becoming, as oh, I said, la, la, la. <laughs> For the present, then, we must conceive of three kinds. The becoming, that wherein it becomes, oh, the becoming, that wherein it becomes, and the source wherefrom the becoming is copied and produced. Moreover, it is proper to liken the recipient to the mother, the source to the father, and what is engendered between these two to the offspring. And also to perceive that if the stamped copy is to assume diverse appearances of all sorts, that substance wherein it is set and stamped could not possibly be suited to its purpose unless it were itself devoid of all those forms which it is about to receive from any quarter. Hey, it's formless. Yeah. Right? Formless. Empty of form. Right. Mm. For were it similar to any of the entering forms or on receiving forms of an opposite or wholly different kind as they arrived, it would copy them badly through obtruding its own visible shape. Right. It's void of all forms. Go ahead. Wherefore it is right that the substance which is to receive within itself all the kinds should be void of all forms. Just as with all fragrant ointments, men bring about this condition by artistic contrivance and make the liquids which are to receive the odors as odorless as possible. And all who essay to mold figures in any soft material utterly refuse to allow any previous figure to remain visible therein, and begin by making it even and as smooth as possible before they execute the work. So likewise, it is right that the substance which is to be fitted to receive frequently over its whole extent the copies of all things intelligible and eternal should itself, of its own nature, 
devoid of all, all the forms. Wherefore, let us not speak of her that is the mother and receptacle of this generated world, which is perceptible by sight and all the senses by the name of earth or air or fire or water. Or rather, any, here it comes. Or any aggregates or constituents thereof. Rather, if we describe her as a kind, invisible and unshaped, all receptive and in some most perplexing and most baffling way partaking of the intelligible, we shall describe her truly. Hmm. Hmm. So, uh, as you look at the world, what are you saying? It's invisible, unshaped, but all receptive. What really is there? Intelligible. When you take that out? Intelligible. And yet, formless, void of form, is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh. And the uh, so-called elements, such like, yeah, they appear this way, out and bam, they float one into the other, yeah, that's true. Hmm. Okay, now we're going to get the conclusion to this section, which is most important for us. Uh, pick it up. Thank you. Insofar as it is possible to arrive at the nature of this kind from the foregoing account, one may state it most correctly in this way. That part of it, that part of it which is made fiery, appears each time as fire. That which has been liquefied as water. And it appears as earth and air, insofar as it receives copies of these. But let us investigate the matter by more exact reasoning and consider this question. Does there exist any self-subsisting fire or any of those other objects which we likewise term self-subsisting realities? Or is it only these things which we see? or otherwise perceived by means of bodily senses that exist, possessed a sensible reality. Besides which, no other things exist anywhere or anyhow. And it is merely an idle assertion of ours that there always exists an intelligible idea of every object, whereas it is really nothing more than a verbal phrase now, on the one hand, it would be improper to dismiss the question before us without a trial and a verdict, and simply to asseverate, as asseverate that the fact is so. While on the other hand, we ought not to burden a lengthy discourse with another subsidiary argument. If, however, it were possible to disclose briefly some main determining principle that would best serve our purpose. Mm -hmm. So, um, now we go into uh, noose and opinion, right reason and true opinion, but it's a good place to stop, okay? For, right? So, let me ask you this, okay? Um, <clears throat> Remember the view he had of sight mm -hmm. yeah. and you catch the image in here and it is just a reflection of this distorted because it's image like but what is this stuff here upon which it is? By the way, could you tell me about this stuff again? What is it? It's 
Such like. Void of form. What else, sir? Borderless. Partakes of the intelligible. Uh, is there any relationship between this Even and, smooth. and that? Hmm. Identical. Hmm. It's identical. Identical. At least the same, yeah. the same things would have to say about one, we must say about I the other. that too. Oh, yeah. Because if this mirror, you know, whatever it is that, that holds fast our impressions, were itself dirty mm. or had marks, then anything you would see would have those marks. Mm. The same kind of reasoning we got here, didn't we? Mm. And this has to be pure and void of all form, etc. as... What is this then? What do they call it again? I forgot. The idea of the good? No, no. Oh, the Let's give another name for it. Sorry. No. Where do you see stuff? The mind. What do you call it again? The mind. Oh, 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 oh. Mind. And what's the difference between mind and uh, the chalk? It's the same. <laughs> it's not a gas. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, by the way, uh, after this, uh, after reading this section on the time is, can you describe its effects on your view of everyday experience? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll be wondering about mind a lot <laughs> Oh, which mind are you talking about? Well, that's a good question. Knocking on the mind. And uh, is he comparing you? Is this necessary for this? The blackboard is inert. Well, the same thing is true for all of nature, right? There's no mind there either. But a, a tree has a principle of, of self growth. No. Self motion where a, a blackboard doesn't. No. See, the view you're holding is a good view, and it's necessary. But isn't this age that we're in magnificent in one respect that by taking any particular thing and hitting it with a big, powerful hammer, you can then break it into its parts and you can then study its parts. And don't they do that again and again and again until they finally use these giant hammers? And what do they discover when they're now down on the level? Nothing. What? Faith. They discover intelligible symmetry. Agree? When you're getting down to the subatomic part, because it's alive. It's alive. It shows design, patterns, repeatability of designs, harmony, symmetry in the tracing of its movements. Hmm. So there isn't any dead, hard stuff. It's all alive. By the way, if they can find symmetry in the, in the uh, pathways of subatomic particles, that means that uh, whatever is moving has intelligibility. You can't have those magnificent patterns if you've seen them. Right? Behind symmetry, there must be intelligibility. I have a friend of mine who's into physics, and he was telling me a story that uh, they just discovered uh, that the smallest thing, you know, and they're now down to 10 to the minus uh, 42 uh, meters, right? Uh, pardon me, not meters, uh, centimeters. 
that they found then that the smallest thing they've discovered, which is depending on the level of uh, string theory, that the ends of the string is what they're looking at. And they're now seeing that something is curious, that they're able to discover, like with uh, the work called Spontaneous Evolution, which is Ralph Lipton's work, that the smallest cells communicate with one another. They now know that. Cells communicate with one another. And therefore, the latest in string theory is they now found that these string theories connect with one another. And my friend who is involved in this curious pursuit thinks they've cracked the code of what it is they're communicating. And what they found so far is there's just one possible statement. Who the hell is pounding away at us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who wants to know? Well, yeah, really. And it was in, uh, it's likely to be true since it was in Sanskrit. <laughs> it certainly makes it more true. Yeah, yeah. yeah it makes it's it older. more true. Yeah. And I never make up stories, <laughs> except when I need them. <laughs> yeah. So look, um, <clears throat> so he's after this. So what did he just do? Is the, is the biggest problem with the idea of providence is that we live in an unintelligible world? And how can you say there's such a thing as a goodness that proceeds all the way down to each and every thing that's living? An appearance of that. Is that the problem? So what is he taking? He's taking, he's shaking us up and saying what you think is a mechanical, solid world without any value or meaning, you're just living on the surface of things. Yeah. And if you want to put aside the surface of things, you know what you're dealing with? <laughs> and get to the point of such likes. Yeah, all he needs to do <clears throat> is to go further and talk about, he calls it intelligent, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. One well, has to put in benefit on top of it, and, and what's happening in the entire universe, though. The whole cookie is goodness. And that's where we're going, but it takes a while to get there. So look here. See these? Go back to where he describes the way in which they transform themselves. Mm -hmm. Remember that? If we put one, two, three, four, and assume they may move in analogies, well, you know, when you do that, uh, find that the way in which he describes these things back there, uh, curiously enough, uh, we're back on, on uh, 49C, uh, he comes up with cannot find this combination among the valid forms of the transformation if those if those can be placed in a four terminology then these cannot be found here they're irrational hmm. is that great therefore if this is all going on see it's just a appearance therefore is irrational in that sense behind it is its intelligibility and, uh, um, uh, 
And of the substance which receives all bodies, the same account must be given. It must be called always by the same name, for from its own proper quality it never departs at all. Well, it's always receiving all things. Nowhere and nowhere does it assume any shape. Hmm. Hmm. Now, he moves that into the father, the mother, and the child in the next section, doesn't he? Um, so, likewise, it's right that the substance which is to be fitted, so the substance which is to be fitted to receive frequently over its whole extent the copies of all things intelligible and internal should itself of its own nature be void of all forms. Hmm. Right. So it's pretty interesting. So therefore it's um, baffling. Right, while partaking of the intelligible. See, because what see all the things, everything that then is experienced, there is just the stuff. Right? But it receives it receives the forms. Therefore, it receives the intelligible forms. But it is c colored, as it were, by these things, which gives the appearance of something radically different from that which formed it. Well, I, I kind of like this section. Do you like this section? You bet. It's weird. Mm -hmm. right. And it's paperback. <laughs> okay, he told us he told us at the beginning of the section that he was going to add a third term, and he called it the receptacle and the nurse. Okay. Uh, nurse of becoming. Oh, and the nurse of becoming. Oh. Let's go back. So what does he end up calling that third thing? Um, if the first two are model copy, what is he calling the third thing? The, well, the there are three things. Hmm? What's that? There are three things, the father, yeah, the mother, and the child. Yeah, but model and copy. And now this third thing is called what? Substance? <sighs> that which is engendered between these two is the offspring. Let's go back to where we were, okay? Back to that very line, please. Could you... Um, we're on page uh, 113. It should be at 49. This is the baffling and obscure thing, the nurse of all becoming. Do you see it further down? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The nurse of all becoming is the third thing. See, because now he's talking about, he's not talking about anything being created. Mm -hmm. right? Because these are not created. These are not separate, distinct things for the power of being in themselves. Mm -hmm. They're not created. It's baffling. Is there a difference between created and generated? The way you're making the distinction? Yeah, because uh, it's baffling to know, since these are not, that they don't have any existence. 
how did they how did they be how how did they come to be generated? And then he says, and this is rather important, I'm glad you mentioned it, I'm, um, it's a way of reading Plato, and it may take skill with Greek as well. When he describes this, right, remember the way he describes it? Gold. He uses the example of gold. Can you get that? Mm -hmm. I'm on uh, page 117, which is uh, 50B. Now, here's the point, okay? Is this, strictly speaking, an example? And the question is, can, can you take that example and say it is like That's dangerous. It's dangerous because the conclusion is pretty interesting because then he's saying this stuff without form is like gold. <coughs> therefore it's sparkling. And therefore it has a luminous quality. <laughs> so therefore is this merely an example or is he going further and saying that's what it is like? Like. So we take a look. Show me in that section. Notice the way he does it. But we must bestir ourselves to explain this matter again, yet more clearly. Now imagine that a man were to model all possible figures out of gold, and were then to proceed without cessation to remodel each of these into every other. And if someone were to point to one of the figures and ask what it is, by far the safest uh, reply and point of truth would be that it is gold. So you're naming. But as for the triangle and the other figures which were formed in it, one should never describe them as being seen that they rub, blah, 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 blah. Rather, such like. Look here. Is it, is it an example, or is he saying that's what it's like? Because the way in which he describes the figures and everything else fits exactly what he has been detailing. You would take what choice? How does T Thomas do it? I think he's, na he's naming the thing by its substance. Like he's not naming the things that are made out of gold. He's naming the things that are made out of gold, gold. He's calling... The substance. Calling each appearance by its substance. Yeah, see, but he, so you but would have to say everything is mine. That's what I would like it to be. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's what I would like you to conclude. But the question is, is that what the text is doing? I that's what it said. It see, is, he's, naming he's just giving an example. Yes, but he's saying you would not name... Can you conclude from the example that that's what it is like? That's a different kind of attribution, right? It's attributing something else to it. Well, he says it must be called always by the same name, for from its own proper quality it never departs at all. And, um... Here. Easy. Just because you can say... Well, just because you can say the soul is like a state doesn't mean the state is a soul. Correct. So it's like. Hmm. But here we're saying, can you make that jump here? Well, he told us to. I mean, he told us that he was giving us another way of looking at it. He's, he's going over it again. He just got done telling us. See, let me tell you why. The difference okay. between such like okay. and... Yeah, I'm with you. Okay. okay. Let me reread it, and then you won't have any trouble. Now imagine that a man were to model all possible figures after the finest of pure clay. Uh -huh. Would everything follow with clay? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. The difference, yeah. Huh? Would you <laughs> say, therefore, mm -hmm. this is clay like? Such like. Uh uh. That's right. I just took away the light mm -hmm. and the luminosity by changing from gold to clay. So what else do you need in this example to go to the light rather than you need the outside, to the You need the outside source of light to give it any luminosity or appearance of luminosity. Or he needs to put in a couple of words. Yeah. Or are they sufficient words? Because, uh, you know, the nature of being is said to be a luminous, right? Being is the most uh, luminous light of being. Therefore, there's a, right, you can make a step, you can say, well, that's being. If it's like gold, that goes further in the direction of being luminous, right? Being is said to be the most luminous light of being. Or have that quality in the Republic as well as uh, elsewhere, but especially the Republic. See, well, the whole scientific tradition up, up to the 20th century was that this is dead. It should be dead. There should be nothing behind it living. I'm essentially dead. If you go, it should end up with elements that don't transform themselves or remain static, and they come into existence of random forces, etc., which has been dumped, of course, since uh, several people did some good work. Rutherford, Einstein, and Emmy Noether. So, let me get back to the, what do you think? Does it have any effect on the way in which you consider and think about the universe, the physical universe? I just dissolved. <laughs> just dissolved. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Now, when I first read this, this uh, I said, oh my God, now I, uh, I see what this guy is doing. It's the problem of, uh, in Hinduism. So. Maya. It's yes. all Maya. Yeah. Uh-uh, let us say, no, it's not. See, if you can go this far, further, you can say, if it's Maya, it's gold-like. Because mm -hmm. it also means gold has a quality of being rare, right, valuable in itself, etc. You can make other associations with gold that you couldn't make with clay. But you can tell the same story using the word clay without those associations with it. So therefore, if you were to carefully go over that, is there anything that might suggest you can make the leap, or shall we just leave it exactly that, a pure example, and he's not making the, uh, attributing to it the kinds of things we'd like to hear, which is that it has a luminous, rare quality, and therefore is great value. You're forgetting change. Yeah. Oh. Um. And of the substance which receives all bodies, the same account must be given. Always the same name. For from its own proper quality, never departs. But always receiving all things, no wise does it assume any shape similar to anything that enters into it. The figures that enter and depart are copies of those that are always existent, being stamped from them in a fashion marvelous and hard to describe, which we'll investigate later. Anyhow, that's as far as I want to go. What do you think? Because from here on we pick up news and right opinion or intellect and right opinion and go further on a different direction.
I think it's a good place to put. Fair? Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. All right. Fun? Yes. Good. All right. And Barbara suggested that uh, Marty said that he was going to grade all the papers that Barbara suggested. Barbara suggested that we'll have a test on the time is. And uh, I said, okay, if she wanted to do that, and Marty agreed to grade them all. Okay. Oh, man, Thomas Taylor makes it easier. <laughs> do you want to grade them? No. Thomas Taylor makes this one quote. Please? Where? He's at 50, 50 D. Well, oh, 50, I know that good section. Here? You, you got a good Thomas one. Taylor? Yeah. No, 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 thank you. Hold on uh, to that. 452. 50, uh, pardon? Stephanus? This is, uh, the Stephanus is 50 D. 50 D. D as in dog. Go ahead. Okay, uh, but the forms which enter and depart from this receptacle are the imitations of perpetually true beings and are figured by them in a manner wonderful and difficult to describe, as we shall afterwards relate. At present, however, it is necessary to consider three sorts of things. One, that which is generated, another, that in which it is generated, and the third, that from which the generated nature derives its similitude. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the three things we've just been talking about? Well, that's rather important difference, you see. Uh, can you read it again? Watch. Three things. One, that which is generated. Another, that in which it is generated. And the third, that from which the generated nature derives its likeness or similitude. Well proper to assimilate that which receives to a mother, that from whence it receives to a father, and the nature situated between these to an offspring. Well, that's not what you read a moment ago. I no. better get the other text. Um, Wait a minute. Mm. That was the following sentence. You read the sentence before. Okay, let's go back. In the same manner, we should speak concerning that nature, which is the general receptacle of all bodies. For it never departs from its own proper power, but perpetually receives all things, and never contracts any form in respect, in any respect similar to any one of the intromitted, I've never seen that intromitted. word, intromitted forms. It lies indeed in subjection to the forming power of every nature becoming agitated and figured through the supernally intermitted forms. And through these it exhibits a different appearance at different times. But the forms which enter and depart from this receptacle are the imitations of perpetually true beings. Stop. To that last part. Mm -hmm. but, the forms which enter. but the forms which enter and depart from this receptacle are the imitations of perpetually true beings. So everything in the visible world is nothing other than a copy. Imitations of true being, mm -hmm. right? Or what they sometimes call foolishly forms. Mm -hmm. To explain the out of sameness and different united to come to soul. Are we looking now at another version of sameness, the form mm -hmm. and different? Mm -hmm. And the child, mm -hmm. which comes from the mother and father, right. is the principle of the soul. That's right. So he's basically refining. Redefining. Re That's right. But what, what he started out with in a different way. 